Oh, good morning. Are there any announcements this morning, aside from the fact that we're going to have a congregational meeting after this worship service? No? No? So I'll start with a, they say you should never start with an apology, but I'm going to start with an apology, because had I been a little closer to being on the ball, I would have mentioned to you folks that today is Pentecost and encourage you to wear something red. I also would have mentioned to the secretary that it was Pentecost so that she could distribute a sign-up list so that people could get a geranium. I told her I'd take care of it. I know a guy. So if you're so moved after worship, please take one of the geraniums home, plant it, and enjoy the, the spirit that is intended to go with it. So it is Pentecost, and it snuck up on a lot of us, I think. I was uh, uh, sort of, oh, it's Pentecost. And, and I had to think about it for a little bit and remembered that it's actually the, the tradition with it was that there was the Festival of the Weeks, which was a festival, a harvest festival of some nature, took place in Jerusalem. And as they were gathered there, the disciples of Christ, along with more or less 120 people, I think is what the scripture indicates, were gathered together, and suddenly there was a great wind that came through, and tongues of fire descended upon all of the disciples, who then began to speak in tongues. They began to talk in all of the different languages of the people that were gathered there in Jerusalem. There were many different languages, and the disciples were able to talk to all of them in their own language. And the people gathered said, what does this mean? Peter stood up and proceeded to preach to them, telling them the story of Jesus and the saving grace that he brought to those who believed in him. And as he proceeded to do this, the people were wrapped by his words. And finally, when he was done, they looked at each other and said, what should we do? And Peter's response is, repent and be baptized. As each of us hears the words of Jesus, as each of us experiences the, the warmth that comes from the Holy Spirit that has descended upon each of us, may we repent. Repenting means change. May we change in some way to better serve our Lord and our Savior, Jesus. That's Pentecost. Today is the day that the Lord hath made. Come together, let us rejoice and be glad in it. Come to this place of prayer. God is calling us. Come, all who are burdened, there is healing here. We have come to hear the word of God. We have brought with us all ways us down. Let voices of praise greet the one who calls us. Be glad together and sing for joy. Our hearts respond with hope for a new day. Our voices join in thankful prayers and praise. God reigns among us and fills the word with light. We are invited to make our home with the living God. May God's ways be known within and among us. May God guide all nations in ways of peace. Please join me in singing our opening hymn as we stand together. We have heard the joyful sound.
Also, I wanted to note before we start that um, there is an envelope um, at the back of the sanctuary. Um, we're going to collect those envelopes at the end of, the, um, of our day here. Uh, it's for Pentecost Sunday. Good. So if you please fill them on and put them at the back, that would be greatly appreciated. Although we believe and trust in God, we have forgotten the covenant which God made with our ancestors, and we have sinned. However, God shows the mercy promised to our ancestors and remembers this holy covenant, giving us the knowledge of salvation but of the forgiveness of our sin. By the tender mercy of our God, the dawn will break upon us, shining into the darkness and the shadow of death guiding our feet into the way of peace. Peace be with you and also with you. Please take a few moments to express the peace of Christ to those around you today. All who keep God's word know God's love but, and live by it. But, but obedience is not easy amid all the world's distractions, and the gift of love is not incorporated into our lives without effort. There is a gap between intention and reality, a chasm we create between ourselves and God. That is why we observe a time of confession. Almighty God, we have wandered far from your love. We have neglected our word in the torrent of words that we hear and read every day. Our hearts are troubled amid the complex and violence of our world. Sometimes we find it easier to withdraw from everything, to resist change. Let's more. We know you are reaching out to heal us. Help us to respond. We know we're surrounded by your love. Let us fill it deep within that we may reflect that our love. Amen. Amen. Please join me. Oftentimes I have been so overwhelmed by life that I just, I just want to retreat in. I don't want to be bothered by anybody. I don't want to have those phone calls. I don't want to have those problems pointed out to me again and again. I don't want my children screaming at me that I should have, I could have, I wish they had. Just leave me alone. And I think a lot of us can say that they've been there too. That is sometimes a time of healing, sometimes a time of rejuvenation, sometimes it's a time of despair where you start into that cycle and you just continue to fall deeper into despair because what are you going to do? There's no one there to help you. <laughs> of course there is. Of course there is. And as you, as you face those moments where you're just trying to settle yourself and to be alone, don't settle yourself and be alone from Christ. We do that occasionally. We do find that he is 
over there and we're over here and we don't want to go there and we don't think he can come here. But he did come here. He did come to each of us. He did come in a way that saves us and guarantees us life. So as we in our life have those moments when we want to be quiet and left alone, let us not forget that Jesus is there beside us to comfort and to encourage. The Holy Spirit given on this day to help, encourage, comfort, strengthen, guide, whatever you need, it's there for you. And we as Christians can say hallelujah and thank you for Christ lived, for Christ died, for he rose again to forgive us of our sins. We are clean because of his saving grace. Know that it is on this day that with great joy I can proclaim to you that it is through your faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and as Savior that your sins are forgiven. Amen. Teach us your way, O Lord, and lead us on a level path. Teach us, O Lord, to follow your decrees, then we will keep them to the end. Give us understanding, and we will keep your law and obey it with all our hearts. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Today's Old Testament reading is from Psalm 67. It's the NIV version. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine on us so that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. May the people praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you rule the peoples with equity and guide the nations of the earth. May the peoples praise you, God. May the, all the peoples praise you. The lands yields its harvest, God. Our God blesses us. May God bless us still, so that all the ends of the earth will fear him. I need that mic. Anyone that way? There you go. That's right. Good job, newbies. I love that I gave you a little prep time. All right, so I'm going to get right into it. Let me start my stopwatch, booyah. So first thing I wanna tell you is my job when I come up here is, did you say it's your birthday? No, that's not, I was just telling people about that. Oh, you were telling, we can talk more about them. That's exciting. So my job when I come up here is I, I have to teach you about the Bible. And there's different books in the Bible and there's this one book called Psalms. It starts with the S sound, but it has a magic P at the beginning. So sometimes I like to call it Psalms because it's funner. Well, Psalms, sometimes when you do it, you sing because it's a song like that. So that's one of the reasons why I like Psalms so much. But it has all these numbers. And if you're new to the Bible, you don't know all about the numbers. And that's my job to teach you. There's one called Psalm 127. And in the Psalms are little tiny verses. So I'm concentrating on verse three. Now, do you see my finger right there? It says, yeah, it is the number one, but look, I wrote Psalm 127, verse three. That way I wouldn't forget. Some people think I don't necessarily read my stuff, but I read it. Look at all the notes I took. 
here's the next note. It says that children are our heritage and our offspring is a reward. Sometimes it doesn't feel real rewarding. Sometimes it seems like an exercise in massive exhaustion. But what I really wanna talk about is heritage. Daisy doesn't know I'm calling her up here. Daisy, come here. Come here, my child. So this, this is my offspring. She is my blessing. It says they are a blessing. Daisy, turn around and stand all pretty before them and hold this. Bam. Daisy didn't even know I was bringing this in right now. Now this is my Daisy. Daisy had a grandma. That's my mom, Kathy. My mom, Kathy, had a mom. And her mom's name was Elma. Elma had a mom. And guess what her name was? Daisy. 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 So Daisy is named after her great-great-grandma. And that's a picture of her right there. Now, her great-great-grandma went to school and she got report cards. This was her report card from 1894. Now Daisy right here, my heritage, my offspring, my blessing, she has made president's list her first semester at college. She got one more. <laughs> now, she got a B, that's why she didn't like she didn't get a perfect 4-0. She got one B in math. Her great-great-grandmother, Daisy, lowest grade on this report card, math, <laughs> runs in the family. Thank you, honey, you can sit down now. We'll take this downstairs and you guys can check it out. And if you wanna see it, Miss Donna, I know you guys wanna check that out. Yeah, 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 so it's cool. So, the reason why I told you guys all of that is that was my heritage, my offspring. But you two, That's right, and you, you're your grandma's heritage. She drags you here in an awesome way, and your parents are excited. In fact, one of these days, your dad's gonna fly here in a helicopter. Give me five, I know, that'll be cool. That'll be great, we'll all be excited. We'll put a Healy pad just for him, because he flies helicopters, people. Flies helicopters, that's impressive. So I tell you guys this, because for me, I get all excited. My whole house is surrounded with heritage. I love heritage. I love knowing that I stand on the foundation of God. And I stand on that foundation because God in that book that we read, he made all these promises to me. And one of those promises is that my offspring, they're going to bless me. But it takes me an epic amount of work for that to happen because I am also a blessing to the heritage before me. And it goes on and on and on, and it'll go on for you guys too. And that's what God promises. But he does it in a very special way. See this building? This building helps hold, protect, and push that promise forward. We can do it without the building, but this building, this church, and all the churches are important and essential for you to go to so that you can learn how important that is. Fold your hands and close your eyes. Dear Heavenly Father, Thank you for our heritage. Thank you for our foundation. Thank you for filling the pews. Lord, help us to continue that. Sometimes offspring isn't just who came out of us. Sometimes children aren't just the children that were given by DNA. Sometimes children are all the children and all the blessing and all the offspring that you gave the whole entire world. In your blessed and holy name we all say, So heritage is something that we all um, are aware of, and some of us pay more attention to it than others, and I have a tendency to, it comes and goes with me, where I think sometimes of, of those who have come before me, and then sometimes um, I, don't, I don't connect as well. But uh, my comment on heritage today is I'm wearing my grandfather's red stole which again is probably over 100 years old. So I honor those who have come before me and stood 
in a similar position, preaching the word of God. And uh, I humbly, humbly try to follow in their footsteps. The New Testament reading this morning comes from John. It is not a Pentecost message. But it is something that I was kind of, I don't know, when I read it, I was like, hmm, that's what I want to preach on. So I hear the words of God as they are revealed in John chapter 5 in the first nine verses. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. That would be the festival of weeks, I think. Now, there in Jerusalem near the Sheep's Gate, a pool which the Aramaic which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered coronades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had not been, had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there, he and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I am trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. When Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. The day on which this took place, was a Sabbath. May the Lord bless unto us this reading from his holy word, and unto him be all glory and all praise. And Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of, of our heart bring glory to you. For it is in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So my mother, Presbyterian, actually United Presbyterian, daughter of a missionary, had to deal with her mother-in-law, my grandmother. And my grandmother was a covenanter. And for those of you that have been in Mars for maybe a generation or two, might remember that there were two Presbyterian churches in Mars, and behind the one Presbyterian church, which is now an apartment building, was sort of a white clappered building that looked very sort of austere and really had not much going on. That was the covenanter church. They were a very conservative group. They didn't believe in uh, singing. There was no organs. There was very little uh, fanfare. There was a lot of austerity. And that was my grandmother. As a child, she would come to visit with us, and she would stay with us for a few months at a time. Uh, no one really ever talked about it, but my mother was not my mother was not, shall we say, uh, on the same page <laughs> as her. So, I, so oftentimes a few months would seem like a few years. Mommer, which was her name that the grandkids called her, uh, she had a very hard life, actually. Her husband, my grandfather, was a uh, conductor on the Butler Short Line. Again, if you've been here long enough, you know the Harmony Short Line and the Butler Short Line. He was killed when his trolley car derailed in 1913. He left a widow and four kids, all under the age of 13. At the time, they were living pretty much across from Mary's driveway. There were three or four houses on the Mars Evans City Road, just as you're leaving there. And they lived in one of those. I've never been clear which one it was. But it was, uh, it was company housing. So as soon as my grandfather was killed, my grandmother and kids were shown the door. So it was not, it was not a particularly uh, pleasant upbringing for, for them. Um, my father was too. Uh, my grandmother, mom, or she was, you're really an Old Testament kind of Christian. Um, she had rules really strict rules, which we really would observe very, we adhered to them. At least the rules were followed while she was living with us. So Sundays were a day to study catechisms. No food was to be cooked. 
A black cloth was placed over the phone. <laughs> the term blue law was first established in my house in 1958. <laughs> the, idea, the idea of the Sabbath day being a day of rest and reflection and worship was not really the case as I was growing up. Mostly, uh, the Sabbath was a day for rule observance. I kind of think this was the case back when Jesus was approaching the Sheep's Gate, where there is a, a pool with five porches. The area was just bustling with people who have become the dregs of society, the marginalized, the folks who have been reduced to begging it just to keep their lives alive. They were blind, they were deaf, they were crippled. They, they all huddled together around this pool, waiting, waiting. Waiting for what? Well, waiting for a healing. You see, the pool is mostly, most likely spring-fed. And every so often, there'd be a rush of water that would come in, and there'd be a stirring of the water. It was disturbed. Perhaps it was quite dramatic, but anyway, those who saw it were convinced that the spirit had moved the water. An angel had stirred the water. So, given the divine nature of the pool, people felt that the first one in after the stirring was going to be healed. Now, it seems more like magic than faith, but that's what it was. Anyway, that's the legend about the Sheepsgate Pool at Bethesda. And I, I call it Bethesda, and it's not Bethesda. It's a different pronunciation, which Jim will correct me on. But the original is Bethsaida. Bethsaida. Thank you. I'll try that. Bethsaida. Let's all say it together. Bethsaida. All right. So when this water was stirred at Bethsaida, they thought an angel had stirred the water. The first one into the pool was healed. Maybe you can imagine the chaos whenever the waters rippled. Cripples with crutches, whacking blind people, deaf people tripping the blind and the lame, blind people crying to find out whether the water had been indeed rippled, begging for someone to help them into the water. Every person for themselves. So that's the scene that Jesus walks into. He walked in, stepped through the crowd, and began to speak to a man who had been there for 38 years. Can you imagine 38 years? If I have to sit in a doctor's office for 10 minutes, I get furious. <laughs> 38 years. Jesus could see by the way the man had practically pitched a tent that he had been sick a long time. He was probably the toughest case there, and maybe, maybe that's why Jesus chose him to take the hardest one. But uh, Jesus didn't know if he really wanted to be healed. After 38 years of begging and being taken care of, did he really want to get back to a job and fund and fend for himself? Would it just be easier to stay on the, the downside of love? Being healed would mean no more sympathy, no more pity. And what kind of job could he get anyway? So maybe, maybe better to stay on as a beggar. It was a momentous question to propose to the man because it presented him with a momentous decision. The man first offers an excuse. <laughs> when the angels stir the water, nobody will help me get into the pool. The man may be refusing to assume responsibility for what's happening in his own life. And we all know that there are times when we hold the keys to at least part of our own healing. We hold those keys in our hands. We can quit smoking, we can quit drinking, we can change our diets, we can modify our behavior, take our prescribed medications when we're supposed to. Sometimes we need to assume responsibility for our own healing. But it may be that this man at the sheep's gate pool is simply stating a fact. Maybe it's a free-for-all. Every person for themselves. 
and there is no way for this man to get into the pool alone. It just may be that Jesus gives the man the benefit of the doubt and takes his excuse seriously, thereby taking the man seriously for the first time in 38 years. Now, I kind of believe that's the case. I believe it because when the man says nobody will help him into the pool, Jesus just doesn't focus on the means, but instead focuses on the end. He skips the pool and heals the man directly. He simply tells the man, get up and walk. Well, yeah, let's back up a little bit. It's not nearly as simple as it might seem. Actually, actually it's pretty complicated. Jesus doesn't just tell the man to get up and walk. Jesus says, rise, take up your pallet, and walk. There's the key, you see. That middle phrase, take up your pallet, or your little bedroll. Why bother putting that in the scene at all? Why not just have the guy get healed and let him jump up for joy and run skipping and shouting all the way home? Forgetting the old smelly bedroll, or, or maybe at least just coming back for it later. Yet that's the key to this passage. Not, not the bedroll, but the command to take up your pallet. The pallet was the poor man's bed, a light, flexible mat that was easily rolled up and carried. So what's the big deal? Remember that this was the day of the Sabbath, a Sabbath day. And according to Mishra, the rules, the regulations, and the instructional code that were first oral, orally, trend, uh, oral trend, tradition that was passed down by the rabbis, but it was later written down. There were 39 forbidden to be done. Uh, there were 39 works that were forgid, forgiven there were 39 works that were forbidden to be done on the Sabbath day. They took, these Pharisees took the words of the prophet Jeremiah quite literally. Thus says the Lord, take heed for the sake of your lives and do not bear a burden on the Sabbath day or bring it in by the gate of Jerusalem. Ooh, pretty serious stuff. Do not bear a burden on the Sabbath day. Because the rabbis, at least the more liberal and less literal ones, did allow compassionate acts on the Sabbath. It would have been acceptable to carry a man on the top of his pallet, using it as a stretcher, because then it would have been a case of the stretcher be bearer doing a compassionate act, carrying a crippled man. But it was against the regulations of the law for a man to carry his own pallet himself, because that, you see, was considered carrying a burden, a violation of the scripture. So when Jesus tells the crippled beggar to rise, pick up his pallet, and walk, the man's decision becomes even more momentous, doesn't it? The emphasis shifts from what Jesus is doing to what the man will do. He must, if he is to be healed, do sort of a double no-no. He must violate the Sabbath, keeping the scripture and the law. Two things. And do not bear a burden on the Sabbath day. Mm. The man makes his choice, though, and does it. He walks. He is healed. What's the question they ask the man who is formerly crippled? What's the question? They don't ask, how were you healed? Whatever, whatever it was from the being put, was it because you were put into the pool? Was it by some other means? He's healed. No, they didn't ask that question at all. They seem to care more about that. They didn't seem to care about that. Instead, they asked this question. Who told you to pick up your pal on the Sabbath day? Now, the rabbis allowed works of mercy on the Sabbath day, but the strict Pharisees, who were real nitpickers of the law, since they were really after Jesus, 
the man upsetting the religious status quo, and especially since they figured that man who had waited 38 years could have waited one more day when a non-Sabbath could have taken place. You, they use this event as a time to accuse Jesus. Skip the healing. Let's get Jesus. Now, you've got to see that Jesus, with his practical, common sense approach to his faith and religion, was making the religious figures of his time look like inconsiderate, <coughs> compassionless fools. In trying to accuse Jesus now of violating a Sabbath-keeping law, they were citing an ordinance based on divine example. That is, God rested on the seventh day of creation, so human beings should do the same. This argument they backed up with bits and pieces of scripture, like the ones I just read from Jeremiah about being a burden. They're actually trying to accuse Jesus of working on the Sabbath, of violating the Sabbath-keeping ordinances. Anyway, regarding that question of him working on the Sabbath, Jesus answered them by using the same argument flipped back on them. He argued that healing on the Sabbath day was copying the works of, yes, yes, the work of God. He said, my father is working still, and I, therefore, am working to accomplish my father's works. It was obvious God had been at work only moments earlier in the healing of the crippled man, which meant God worked on the Sabbath. So how could Jesus not work if his father was working? Not only did Jesus ask them with that statement, not only did he make them like heartless, look like heartless, selfish, power-hungry, status quo, uh, but, he had, but he had the audacity to approach God in a, in a very personal way, calling God Father. He said, my Father is working still, and I am working. How dare this young whippersnapper from Nazareth assume any kind of personal relationship with God? Weren't you supposed to stand back and worship God from afar? Keep your distance. Just like standing back and trembling at the smoke and at the voice behind the curtain in the Wizard of Oz. How dare this Jesus put things on such an intimate basis. But Jesus is getting at something else with that statement too. He is saying that God doesn't stop work, working, healing, caring, loving, none of that. The God he speaks of as Father doesn't stop parenting us on the seventh day. That's why the cripple at the Sheepsgate Pool was redeemed to wholeness on the Sabbath day, because it was the power of God, the power of God who loves and continues to be active. But these Pharisees, the one after Jesus' head, aren't conscious of the life-changing power of Jesus as God. They don't need an active, living God because they have their codes their laws, and they, they're more interested in handing out parking tickets. Their view of salvation is one of not getting as many parking tickets as someone else. It's not too unlikely that what we see in today's literalists, the fundamentalists, who use the Bible as a measuring stick and a law book the way the Pharisees used the law in Jesus' time. They don't need a living God, an act of God, because they've got the book, the Bible, the standard, the list of what is acceptable and what is not, against which to judge everyone and everything. But if they've got the book, they don't need God. They think because they hold the standard, they're in a position to ask sharply, okay, who told you to pick up the pallet? Just answer the question. The main points here seem to me, seem to, me to be the man at the pool had to make a decision to be part of his own healing, 
to accept some of the responsibility for his own life rather than toss the blame at everyone else at the time. In making his decision for healing and wholeness and in picking up his pallet on the Sabbath day by one of the Jerusalem, and it even gets worse because he picked it up near the Jerusalem gate, which is, you get, oh my goodness. This man also had to challenge the religious authority structure. He had to completely rethink what religion and his own faith were really all about. Rules and regulations and traditions and dogma which stood guard like a warren, warden he could regularly check in with. Or, or a common sense, active, action-oriented, people-oriented, people-caring faith like Jesus had demonstrated. One that not only allowed for, but embraced a personal relationship with a living, loving, healing, saving, and redeeming God. We're not called to simply observe the Sabbath or any other set of rules and regulations by period. By accepting them unchallenged, by tending toward Bible literalism, we actually block the work of God. If we rely on the Bible, only as a law book. <clears throat> we don't need a living God. We only need the book. God's primary purpose is to save people, to heal them, to love them, not to damn them, as maybe you've heard sometimes. The rules are guidelines by which we live. They are not a yardstick by which the religious measures the less religious, or judges each other. The rules don't establish a right for anyone to judge someone's salvation. In verse 24, Jesus mentions eternal life. He does not say, those who keep rules and hold to a strict hardline approach to the Bible inherit, will inherit eternal life. In fact, what he says is, the person who hears my word and believes in him who sent me, <clears throat> get this, this is the present tense, not a future, not a past, and who sent me, that person has eternal life, not will have, no waiting, we hear and we believe and we have. In today's world, we need to stop judging and nitpicking so that we can turn Jesus and his enthusiastic followers loose to heal and to do God's work, redeeming humanity and making all people whole. Who said you could break the religious laws of the Sabbath? Who authorized you to do that? Jesus. Jesus did. Jesus, my Lord, who showed me something of a living, compassionate, common sense God, and in doing so, Jesus freed me, gave me the courage to make my own decisions about what I will do to seize life. I come that you may have life and have life more abundantly to the glory of God.
As a community of faith, we will now approach God in prayer. I would ask you, is there anything particularly on your heart that you would like to uh, lift up? I would like to request prayers for my nephew, Al Lamb. He will be undergoing a kidney transplant on Friday up in the Cleveland Clinic. Thank you. I'm gonna ask for continued prayers for, the, for John Clark. He's eight years old and I told you before that he um, had a tooth infection and then um, it settled in his heart and then he needs a, a heart transplant. And while in the hospital, he got an infection, had to have a leg amputated. Well, now he needs a liver transplant also. All little John wants is to come home from the hospital. So please pray that they can figure that out, that he may come home and maybe some way he can get one of these transplants. Uh, Thank you. I'd like prayers for uh, the family of Violet Lothar. Vi passed away. Uh, she was not a member of our church, but she did come to our uh, Thursday morning a women's Bible study and just uh, maybe two years ago she stopped driving so Vi was in her late 90s so we're going to miss her very much. Prayers for uh, my new two nephews who lost their grandfather, Walter um, Daniels. Um, and so prayers for the family for their loss. And I would like prayers for uh, my friend, um, Melissa, her stepdad, uh, Don Himber, uh, had pancreatic cancer. They were able to get, a, get everything. He's in recovery. Right now, so just prayers for his recovery as well. Okay. Well, let's pray together. Wait. Wait. Sorry. Sorry, I didn't see. I should have turned around. I beg your pardon. Yeah. We have um, trouble with you. Well, I don't know how to say it that way, but Tim's um, mother has entered hospice. Um, we just got that news. She has struggled for a long time. She's how old is she, Tim? Ninety. She's uh, she's been amazing in her work for God and for family. And uh, there's his three sisters, and then all the the grandchildren and all that will be affected by this, uh, of course. Um, so we just ask for prayers for the family to remember what a matriarch she she has been and been the carrier for our family. Mm -hmm. Let's pray together. Father, we walk outside and we see it to be a beautiful spring day and we, we are grateful for that and we are grateful for the blessings that you have placed upon us. We, we approach you always with gratitude. We approach you always with thanksgiving. We praise you. We praise the name Jesus who has come to give us life eternal through your love. So we do thank you. We do praise you. We do humbly submit ourselves to be your faithful servants. We seek to follow your word. We seek to understand your message in a way that uh, helps not only us individually, but helps our community and the world at large. It is the day that we celebrate, Father, the the birth of the church, Pentecost, the day that the Holy Spirit descended upon the disciples and all who, who believed. 
Father, we know that within each of us there is that little flame that burns. But perhaps on Pentecost, on this day, you could turn that knob up to high, that that flame might burn, all that might fire and give us the energy and the enthusiasm to go out and proclaim your word, to be a better servant, to be a better, more faithful Christian, to understand a little clearer that which you would have us know. Pentecost, the day the fire burns the brightest. May we be inspired by that. But as we come before you seeking a better understanding of you and come before you with praise and thanksgiving, we also come before you with, with petitions, things that are upon our heart that we would like you to be particularly aware of. A young person struggling in the hospital, families who have lost loved ones and are coping with that pain, coping with perhaps the, the uncertainty of the future, understanding for each of us that there is a time and a place when you will call each of us home. And how we are able to, to deal with that and how we are able to understand that those whom we love perhaps will go before us. May you, may you strengthen us for those days. May that journey that we are making be a journey straight to you. We know, Father, that there are people that will proclaim that the road to paradise is pretty narrow. I don't know. I've always found it to be wide, welcoming, all can join together in that march to glory. So, Father, help us to be better at being Christian. Help us to understand your will for our lives. Help us to cope with those things in our lives that are beyond our ability to deal with, things that weigh us down, things that separate us from you. We we see in this world things that seem so contrary to your will, and we, we find it difficult to wrap our heads around your presence in those situations. But we know that you are there. We know that you have a plan. We would ask that that plan include things like a quick and peaceful resolution to the conflicts that are taking place across the world. We see endless what we think of tragedies in Gaza and in Israel. We see what we feel is unjustified actions in Ukraine where people are being slaughtered for what reason, we don't know. May you rise up a peacemaker. May someone be able to bring peace in those areas. May they bring a sense of calm where there is chaos. May they bring a sense of love where there is hatred. May they bring peace where there is only violence. Father, we pray these things, knowing that you hear us, knowing that you love us, knowing that your heart hurts for us as we too hurt. When we, when we experience the loss, we know that you are there to comfort and to strengthen. So again, Father, thank you for your presence in our life. Thank you for your son, Jesus, and thank you for this Holy Spirit that you have sent to be among us and within us. And Father, now may you hear us as we boldly approach you with the prayer that your son lovingly taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Having heard the word of God, may I ask now that you stand and affirm your faith using the affirmation of faith that we see on the screen. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice. I will not be sad. I will not be discouraged. I will not be defeated. I will rejoice and be glad in it. 
Nevertheless, I live. Let not I, but Christ lives by faith in me. I am blessed. I am healed. I am delivered. I am set free. Sickness can't dwell in me. The number of my days he will fulfill. Sin cannot dominate me. Jesus Christ is my Lord. I am in him. His word dwells in me richly. I am more than a conqueror because of his love. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. So I can do all things by Christ. He is my strength as the redeemed of the Lord. I say so. We are blessed, and we seek to be able to return blessings unto God now. May we receive the morning offering. Give freely as you are led. Father, we lift, this, we lift this offering up to you and ask that you would find it acceptable in thine sight, that you would use it as you use us to bring glory to your name here in this place and beyond throughout your kingdom. For it is in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Spirit is here. He has descended and is living within each of us. May we go forth from this place feeling that energy, feeling that strength. May we know him in a way that brings glory to him and brings his word to the people of this world. I would charge you to go out into the world with courage, to hold on to all that is good, to return no one evil for evil, to support the faint-hearted, to help the suffering, to honor all people, and to rejoice in the power and in the presence of the Holy Spirit that is within each of you. 
And now may the grace and the peace and the love of the one triune God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit descend upon us and abide within us now and forevermore. Amen and amen. <laughs>